Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is David Seibeck from Washington, D.C. Today, we're delighted to have Dr. Heli Hetela with us to give us a seminar. Heli received her doctoral degree from the University of Helsinki in October 2012. She was a postdoctoral scientist at Imperial College, then went on to become an assistant and then an associate researcher at UCLA, a senior researcher at the University of Turku, and she now holds a university research fellowship from the Royal Soci Society and is located at Imperial College in London. Kelly is well known to the science community, both in the United States and abroad. She co-led the ISI team entitled Jets Downstream of Collisionless Shocks from 2015 to 2017. She was the lead proposer and has been co-chairing the GEM focus group entitled Dayside Kinetic Processes in Global Solar Wind Magnetosphere Interaction from 2016 until this year. She is now leading an International Space Science Institute team in Switzerland studying four shocks across the heliosphere. Heli uses multi-point observations and models to study shocks, magnetic reconnection, and the radiation belts, focusing upon their structure, formation, and particle energization. Today, she will be talking about the bow shock and foreshock. Please go ahead. Thank you, David. I will now share my screen. Um, is this okay? It's good. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to give this seminar. And I would also like to thank my various collaborators who have participated in uh, uh, putting this talk together, especially the ongoing ECT for shocks across the heliosphere. So today I will give you an overview of the bow shock and the core shock of the Earth. Um, the if I can change the slide. Right, good. Um, so this is the magnetospheric uh, online seminar. So why and do does the bow shock and the core shock matter to the magnetospheric system? If uh, the bow shock processes the solar wind before it interacts with the magnetosphere. So as um, in the system science uh, side, of, uh, we already learned. Um, it is not the pristine solar wind that interacts with the magnetosphere. Also, the emphasis today is on different structures. So the foreshock uh, and the bow shock generate several different sorts of structures that then in, impinge on the magnetosphere and affects its dynamics. Also, in more general um, terms, the bow shock accelerates particles, like all shocks in this universe and it's our closest laboratory for studying particle acceleration processes with multipoint observations. <clears throat> it's also the foreshock and the bow shock environment are host to fundamental physical plasma processes, and it's an, and therefore an actual laboratory to study that sort of processes as well. So there's this whole host of uh, levels in which you can interest yourself in the physics of the bow shock and the foreshock. So the uh, general outline today is to go from larger to smaller structures. Starting with the global structure of the bow shock. So that would be about 20 to 40 Earth radii in scale, talking about the general global uh, bow shock. Then moving on to how the interproteinomic field uh, orientation matters to the general uh, shock dynamics, you get to the shock obliquity, the quasi-perpendicular um, here at the top, and then the quasi-parallel side of the bow shock. So that would be then um, the structure at the scale of, say, 10 RE. And this is also where we'll, we'll talk about the electron and ion four shocks. Then moving on to uh, four shock transient structures, uh, those driven by interplanetary field discontinuities which are larger, and then the intrinsic force structures that are always present in the ion foreshock. 
And finally, we move on to the very fine structure at the 10 to 100 kilometer scale, like the perpendicular shock ripples and the reconnection within the shock front, which was reported for the first time last year. And uh, then we will end us where we go from here. So starting with the uh, general topic of what is a space plasma shock. The bow shock is a fast mode shock, meaning that uh, across, and it's a thin layer across with which the plasma velocity and kinetic energy is turned into uh, thermal energy and magnetic energy. So the downstream side of a shock is slower, denser, hotter, and has a higher magnetic field strength than the upstream. The, in this manner, the flow upstream, which was fast, faster than any speed of information, will then uh, slow down. And at the same time, the speed of information on the downstream side will be higher than on the upstream side. And in this manner, the shock um, um, makes it possible for the, the transition to happen from super fast magnetosonic flow into uh, sub fast magnetosonic flow. Naturally, there is also, in when we talk about plasma, there are other speeds of information, Alvin's speed, sound speed, those are lower than the fast mode speed. And the but they are generally also, the, especially the Alvin Magnum, are used to characterize shocks in space physics. So even though um, the fast magnetosonic Mach number is the key quantity, you will often see quoted what was the Alvin Mach number for the shock. Here on the right, you see a, a cluster observations of a shock crossing. Um, and at the top, you can see how the magnetic field going from upstream to downstream increases roughly by a factor of four. Um, then the magnetic field orientation changes. It turns uh, downstream is den denser. The flow speed decreases. And also its flow orientation changes. And from the lowest panel, where it, when you see the ion spectrograms, you can see that the downstream is also hotter. Now, this is a very textbook example of a one-dimensional shock essentially, this sort of cartoon, but of course our magnetosphere poses a very diff uh, a slightly different sort of obstacle uh, to this solar wind flow. So the magnetosphere, uh, well it's not a sphere, uh, it's more bullet shaped, so even with a spherical object like the, in the cartoon on the left, even the uh, shock is curved on a global scale. And then since the speed of uh, information in the flow has decreased, uh, the flow is able to move uh, and flow past the obstacle in the downstream side. The uh, position uh, of the shock with respect to the obstacle um, depends mainly on the shock Mach number. However, in, since we are interested in, uh, in the magnetosphere as a system, the general size of the magnetosphere itself depends on the solar wind dynamic pressure. So therefore, the location of the bow shock primarily depends on the solar wind dynamic pressure. So here on the right, there is a MHD simulation with varying upstream conditions and um, showing the location of the uh, bow shock and magnetic pose using the dynamic pressure and the logarithm of the Alvin Mach number. And typically, the solar wind dynamic pressure is of the order of two nanopascals. So, therefore, the typical location of the subsolar magnetic pose is at around 10 RE from Earth, and then the bow shock is at about 13 to 15 RE distance from Earth. However, the, this is, can be slightly misleading since the solar wind is so variable. So the location of the Bowser can change drastically over different time events. So in this run, 
you can see that at some times the bow shock extends even beyond this box and then at times of extreme dynamic pressure it can be compressed way uh, inside the penary distance. So whenever you look at a picture of the bow shock as part of the system of the manuscript dynamics it uh, can be um, we should uh, give a very still and uh, unchanging picture. So I find it very informative to look at simulation videos. The key part, um, part of uh, all shocks is in space is that they can accelerate particles to higher energies. This is the way we get information from far objects like supernova remnants in the form of radiation emitted by the uh, accelerated particles. The, mm, therefore, here as a very brief basics of how this and the physics of how this happens. Uh, here on the left is a schematic of shock drift acceleration. So here the shock with, uh, is illustrated with the dashed line. And the left side is the upstream, and the um, right side is the downstream. And as the as a particle gyrates in the gradient of the shock, it then drifts along the convective electric field, and hence gains more energy. The ions drift along it, and electrons drift against it. However, this is uh, one single interaction like this doesn't increase the particle's energy very much because it quickly moves from upstream to downstream and is lost. So the key is to how do you get multiple interactions with the shock. And this is where diffusive shock acceleration comes into place. Here the, you consider how the particle interacts with the various waves and fluctuations upstream and downstream of the shock. And if these scattering uh, are frequent enough, then um, the particle can move several times across the shock. However, here we, I have to emphasize that the Earth's bow shock is relatively small. So, meaning the cross section of about 40 RE. So, under typical solving conditions, and if there's no interplanetary seed particle population, and the observations show that there, there are no ions above about two to 300 keVs. This is due to the, the uh, limited size of the bow shock. If any particle, even if it's get injected into the diffusive acceleration process, it will soon drift away from the shock and it's lost downstream. Uh, however, of course, if there's higher energy seed particles in the solar wind, then you can get up to 2 MeV or higher. Now, then how do we, how do these particles then actually uh, interact with the shock? How, how, what defines how they gyrate nearby it? The key quantity here is the angle between the upstream and the field and the shock normal angle. So here on the left, you can see that in the case where the upstream magnetic field is uh, has a large angle between the shock normal, then a particle that is reflected by the shock, by the magnetic mirroring, will soon gyrate back into the shock. And this is called a quasi-perpendicular shock. In the, in the other case where the angle between the upstream magnetic field and the shock normal is large, very small. Then a reflective particle can stream long distance upstream against the incoming flow along the magnetic field line. And the reflective particles then can interact with the upstream incoming flow. And this is called a quasi-parallel shock. The Distinguish, uh, distinction between the two is not strictly at, well, often we say that it's at 45 degrees, but the 45 degrees is no magic angle 
in terms of the actual physics. It's just nice way of compartmentalize things. So it's more like, more like when you're very clo closer to 90 degrees, then you have perpendicular dynamics and uh, closer, um, closer to zero degrees, then you have quasi parallel dynamics and then you have an intermediate oblique region. Here I show also two examples of space gap crossings of quasi perpendicular and quasi parallel shocks. Here on the left are MMS observations and this is an interval of only 30 seconds. So when you zoom in to a quasi-perpendicular shock, you can start to see some structure, but only at a very uh, fine, fine scale. And you can here see from the lowest panel of the ener energy spectrogram that there are not much upstream energetic particles associated with the shock crossing. Only very close to the shock ramp in a region called the shock foot. However, here on the right is a quasi parallel shock region. That's a half an hour of observations from cluster. And you can see that it's a very messy region because the particles that are reflected by the shock are interacting with the incoming flow and generating instabilities and further nonlinear structures. So at the top panel here, we see plenty of high, uh, particles at the 10 k uh, keV range. All of them reflected and by the shock and streaming against it. Also of note here is that the upstream magnetic field, the IMF, was only about four nanoteslas, but these pulsations at the parallel shock, when the field magnitude can easily reach uh, 10 or more times the upstream magnetic field, but only locally. Now moving to our own Bauschock from this textbook, uh, sort of uh, 1D cartoons. In a curved Bauschock, the quasi-perpendicular and quasi-parallel regions naturally quite exist. And then, so at any given time, for any given interplanetary field orientation, there are regions on the Bauschock that are quasi-parallel and regions that are quasi-perpendicular. And where these regions are, depends on the IMF cone angle. So the angle between the solar um, sun-earth line and the IMF. And I typically it's noted with alpha. And that's due to the symmetries that's limited between zero and 90 degrees. So when the cone angles are small, the quasi parallel region is at the subsolar part of the Bauschock. And then for higher cone angles, the quasi parallel region moves to the flanks of the Bauschock and the nose is quasi perpendicular. So, when we're talking about the different effects that the shock has on magnetic dynamics, the cone angle is a key quantity to consider as it tells you what sort of dynamics was going on at the time at which part of the magnetosphere, whether it was the subsolar point or the flanks. The uh, system, the symmetries are also such that if you look at the, the shock in the plane that contains the solar wind velocity vector, so the sun or line essentially, and the IMF, then the system is symmetric in the plane, uh, in this plane. However, as we are dealing with observations, it's often illustra illustrative to consider things in 3D. So here on the right, I have an orange a model of the Bauschock, and then in blue lines, illustrating the lines where the reflected particles would stream against the solar wind. And using such a 3D model, it's sometimes easier to see whether uh, in which part of space uh, different spacecraft are. So how do the particles that reflect are reflected by the curved Bauschock then behave in the upstream region. The region uh, that is upstream of the shock and magnetically connected to it and filled with the energy uh, and the reflected particles is called the core shock. 
And because it's filled with the refractive particles, there are also the associated instabilities and waves in play. The, here in this nice cartoon, we have the curved bow shock, and the left side is the quasi perpendicular side, where here you can see the tangent point. Then, as the particles are reflected, uh, the E cross B drift velocity due to the solar wind convective electric field is the same for all particles. So that leads to the fastest particles that were reflected and to be seen uh, closest to the tangent field line. And as the uh, energy, the speed of the particle after reflection is proportional to the speed it had before reflection, this reflection is specular. Then the uh, that leads to the electrons being seen closest to the tangent field line. And then the um, slower ions are slower than the electrons, so therefore they are seen deeper, further away from the tangent point. And the slower the ions are, the further away they are located at the side of the power shock. This velocity filter effect also leads to that in a curved, curved system, uh, the particles reflected at a, a higher theta bn value will then advert and be, affect the shock front at lower theta bn value. In this, it is assumed that for a system that has smaller, uh, larger radius of curvature like the ICME shock, this sort of behavior would not be as significant as for Earth. Then if you go even to an even smaller system like Venus or Pluto, then this interaction between the quasi perpendicular and quasi parallel side becomes even more uh, dominant than at Earth. So therefore, even though a laboratory is easy to access, it's not always easy to study very pure so dynamics at Earth because of the quasi-parallel and quasi-perpendicular side uh, cross-talking. Let's look at the electron foreshock first a little bit before the ion foreshock. In the electron foreshock, there are electron beams of over 100, over 1 keV, and those generate Langmuir waves at the electron plasma frequency a little bit above, which can then convert into radio emission at twice the electron plasma frequency. And I have here highlighted really nice statistical maps built from geotel observations, which show uh, this process in a very uh, illustrative manner. So at the uh, right hand side is the, uh, you can see that there are more uh, 1 to 9 kV electrons closest to the tangent point, which is here drawn in as a white line. And then at that same place, you have the strongest Langmuir wave emission. And then that is converted into a bit broader radio emission. And this process is very similar to um, radio bursts from the sun. Um, so this is also uh, has been um, this electron foreshock at Earth has been instructive in studying these universal processes of radio emission in situ. There's a similar uh, uh, velocity dispersion in the ion foreshock, and for to consider the ion distribution functions, it's uh, illustrative to consider hybrid velocity simulations. In hybrid velocity simulations, uh, the electrons are treated as a fluid and ions are treated as uh, three-dimensional uh, distribution functions. And the model that um, solves this hybrid ap approach in a global magnetospheric size system is called the glaciator. And here on the left-hand side, there's a map from a velocity run of what is the velocity of the reflected ions with respect to the incoming solar wind speed. And, uh, 
you can see that the tangent field line here in white, but then, so there are no ions immediately on the tangent field line. But then a little bit deeper in, you can see very fast uh, beams in red. And then as you go deeper and deeper into the ion force shock, the velocity of the reflected ions slows down. Mm. Next, let's consider the, what the actual distribution functions look like and compare them to IC observations. So here in this red is a three-dimensional plot of the IO distribution from the hybrid class of simulation. The black line is the magnetic field orientation and the small red ball, that's the core of the solar wind. And here, at the very edge, at location E, we can see that there is a the reflected ions are streaming along the magnetic field. So these are called field aligned beams. Here at the bottom is a, a pseudo three dimensional rendering of the IC observations, where the peak corresponds to the solar wind core population, and then the population to the side is the field aligned beam. We can now similarly consider different uh, locations in the core shock of how does these distributions look like. So for example, here at location I, the beam is no longer as fast, so not so far away from the solving core, and it's wider. And the, uh, in the observations, it has um, uh, it has moved from into a more kidney bean sort of shape. And these are called intermediate ions. Finally, if we look here at the very close to the bow shock, we so see the so-called diffuse ions, where the reflected ions form a um, shell or a sphere or all around the solar wind core. But it should be noted that the solar wind core is still there. So there's um, this, uh, the changes in the solar wind core population itself are very small compared to the actual, then the temperature and other properties of the core shock are mainly due to the presence of this uh, reflected ions. Now this is the way everything looks in a very steady state situation. So there's this behavior of the reflected ions being located in this vast region of the ion force shock if there, if there are no changes in the solar wind conditions. But of course we know that the solar wind is highly variable and contains many uh, structures. For example, the IMF uh, changes orientation in a sharp manner. That's then called an IMF discontinuity. So let's, 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 let's look at the structures that are formed when such an interplanetary discontinuity interacts with the foreshock. Um, these are now called then the driven foreshock structures. The, if you have, uh, for example, a rotational discontinuity, as illustrated in this picture. So here you have the quasi power power shock, and then we have a magnetic field line that changes direction sharply across the discontinuity. Then the backstream ions will change part of, upon interacting with the discontinuity, part of their energy will be, velocity will turn into thermal, and they will start concentrating on the upstream side of the discontinuity and this is continuity and this bubble of hot ions will then start expanding to the upstream side. And if the expansion is fast enough, it can form a compression and even a secondary upstream shock ahead of the so-called foreshock bubble. The, they, can, they are usually driven by rotational or thin tangential IMF discontinuities and their size of these force bubbles is 
larger than 3RE. In principle, based on simulations, they could be as size as the whole core shop. And here you can see the key characteristics in uh, spacecraft observations of a core shop bubble. It has the low field strength core. It has also low density, which is hot. And the plasma is deflected in there. And the characteristic upstream shock here at the leading edge. The occurrence rate of uh, portugal bubbles is about one per day under favorable high solar wind speed conditions. And naturally, since the solar wind is essentially full of discontinuities, one might ask that, well, doesn't every, every discontinuity cause some sort of bubble? Well, only when the foreshock is strong enough and the reflection is strong enough, so when the solar wind speed is high enough and the Mach number is high enough. The other type of uh, driven foreshock structure is called a hot flow anomaly. In this case, the, if you have a discontinuity that is intersecting with the bow shock in a manner which leads to the convective electric field pointing towards the discontinuity on the, at least one side, then the suprathermal ions, the reflected particles that is, then are channeled in, um, into this discontinuity and then start heating it up and lead to, uh, again, a low density core that is hot and has a plasma deflection, sometimes even sunward velocities. Uh, or that was if you only consider the moment of the plasma uh, distribution. The new MMS observations actually show that the, at the core of the hot flow anomaly, the solar wind core is simply totally dispersed and it's full of uh, diffuse ions. The size of the hot flow anomalies in the in cross section is about a few RE. But naturally, they extend, in this case, into the, into the plane direction, as large as the cross-section of the bow shock. Uh, and size, or let's say thickness, of the hot flow anomaly increases as it travels over the bow shock from the perpendicular side to the quasi-parallel -par side. And it gets bigger and hotter, and the uh, compressions on its either side, as it expands, get more and more shock-like. The occurrence rate of uh, hot flow anomalies is about two per hour under favorable high solar wind speed conditions. The key, there are two types of key effects that have recently been highlighted with the driven force of structures. The, one of them is particle acceleration. So these transients with hot low density cores and compressional boundaries, uh, the leading edge shock can reflect solar wind ions leading into a new secondary core shock. So here is a hybrid peak simulation of the uh, magnetosphere and the bow shock with a rotational discontinuity indicated here and a core shock bubble forming ahead of it. And there's a new uh, shock and a new core shock ahead of it. There's also occasional ion acceleration in the uh, these um, transient structures, but the main importance is that the electrons are always accelerated, and sometimes they are accelerated even up to hundreds of kVs. From um, and this represents a new development for particle accelerator modeling, since these are the sort of details it's not possible to observe remotely for the sun or for the other shocks in the, uh, in the universe. Only here on Earth and also in other planetary environments, in fact, have we been able to see what does this sort of interaction of reflected ions and discontinuities of the incoming flow due to the um, particle acceleration. The other key effect of the driven structures is the magnetospheric effects. 
So as uh, these uh, structures interact with the magnetosphere, they have uh, different sort of signatures. The Foshock bubble is expected to have an almost global out in motion as the magnetosphere for first responds to the large low density core and then to the leading shock. A hot flow anomaly on the other hand uh, causes a sweeping bulge on the magnetopause. So therefore also the magnetospheric effects would then travel uh, from one side to another side in local time. And these effects include magnetospheric waves, aurora, and you can also see the effect on crown magnetometers. But these are the sort of large scale transients that are caused by the solar wind uh, discontinuities. But what about these intrinsic, intrinsic structures that are always there? The oh, overview of the process is nicely illustrated in this uh, vaciator simulation. So as the ions, shock reflected ions stream against the solar wind, the color coding here is the operating mode density. So you can see a slightly higher, a, a lighter blue here at the edge. They then generate waves that have a 30 second period. These waves are advected back towards the shock. Um, you can start to see them here. Uh, at the UL wave boundary, as it's called. And here on this uh, downstream of that boundary, you see the contours that show the outer plane magnetic field. These waves then undergo nonlinear interactions with themselves, the ion distributions, the locally generated waves. And all, all, all that results into very nonlinear structures that are then seen even closer to the bow shock. Some of them are distinctive, distinctive enough to merit their own names. The truss uh, of the wave field lead to cavitons and spontaneous hot flow anomalies. And the peaks or the enhancements in the wave field can then, be, then lead to shocklets and short lots amplitude magnetic structures. And we will then that's the general overview of how the process works. And we will now visit the key phases in three slides. So it all starts with the waves. Naturally, there are many different types of waves in the foreshock because the, most of the distributions are highly unstable. But the key wave here is this uh, sunward propagating fast magnetic waves that are generated by the right hand ion beam instability between the solar wind and the reflected ions. Their period depends on the IMF strength and orientation. And with some certain simplifications, you can write up this formula. And at Earth, this typically leads to a per period of about 30 seconds and a wavelength about one RE. And hence, they are named 30 second waves. Naturally, this is not a sharp peak at 30 seconds. There's a lot of variability around it. Similarly, the, the wavelength vector is deflected about 20 degrees from the magnetic field due to the refraction by spatially varying thermal ions. Again, there's a variability in the k vector orientation about these 20 degrees. And they are large amplitude of order one. Uh, um, cluster observations were also able to show that their size is such that they are coherent over the scale of about 10 RE in the cross, uh, across their um, uh, field, such that the here in the vaciator simulation, you can see in color the same amplitude uh, stretching across a very large section of the foreshock. 
there's a very nice recent review of the uh, various types of waves in the upstream of shocks by Lynn Wilson. So I would like to direct you to that. As these uh, waves are converted by the solar wind towards the shock, as they, because their waves um, phase speed is slower than the solar wind speed, they end up modifying the shock and they are also transmitted into the magnetosphere. Then next, let's consider what happens as the troughs of the wave field start to enhance. The cavitons uh, are the presence of uh, intensity and magnetic field strength of at least 20%, but there's no temperature increase. And then they have these enhancements of magnetic field so-called shoulders at their outer edges. And these you can see then deeper in the foreshock surrounded by uh, less intense waves. And these are formed by inter interaction of parallel and obliquely propagating waves. Then when these cavitons then propagate even closer to the uh, bow shock, they can form into um, spontaneous hot flow anomalies. So essentially structures that have the same characteristics as the driven hot flow anomalies, but these are formed spontaneously by the shock dynamics itself. So here is a very nice STEMI study on the right hand side showing and tracking a caviton, which was uh, changed in density and magnetic field, but not yet temperature and how it evolved into a hot, spontaneous hot flow anomaly. The size of these structures is similar to the 30 second wave, so about one RE, and their effects include modifying, or let's say weakening the bow shock. And they may also lead to uh, minor sheath cavities. Next, uh, as another you know, side of the coin, if you want to think about it that way. We started with the 30 second waves. And some of those start to steepen and to such a degree that uh, they are called shocklets, which are associated with the uh, Whistler wave packets, seen here with cluster observations, and diffuse backstreaming ion distributions. And they are generally considered that they are more compressive than the ULA waves themselves and uh, observed naturally closer to the bow shock. And their size is um, again about the size as the 30 second waves from which they develop. But finally, we have uh, short large amplitude magnetic structures or slams, which are fast mode pulsations that have a, a compressibility that is even larger than the shocklets. Usually the threshold set at about two, but if you look at observations, they can be up to 10 times the background magnetic field. And their size is slightly smaller. They're more compressed than the uh, shocklets. So about uh, of the order of a thousand kilometers or so. And they, they, affect, and they are key building blocks of the quasi shock because as they are converted to the quasi uh, shock, they essentially turn into the shock itself. As they, um, they participate into the ion energization by reflecting and trapping the ions. So as an overview picture, we have now established that the quasi shock is this patchwork of structures at about one RE scale and slightly less for the slams. This gives you the impression that the there's uh, that is there nothing going on on the quasi-perpendicular side? Well, there is, but we need a bigger magnifying glass to look at it. So with MMS, we have been able to see in quantitative detail, the quasi-perpendicular shock surface ripples. 
these are part of the shock noise stationarity that um, stems from it reflecting ions, but not smoothly or for the same way everywhere at, at every time, but varying at different locations. These uh, ripples were predicted by simulations. And now with MMS uh, has obtained quantitative observations to show that the ripple wavelength is about of the order of 100 kilometers, about four upstream ion inertial lengths, and the ripple amplitude is about 10 kilometers. So that's this MMS phase crack separation. And here, a nice study by Yulander et al. reconstructing what the ripple looked like as the MMS was skimming the quasi perpendicular side. These um, ripples affect electron acceleration, but they also affect the ion reflection process as the shock is more reflective at some places than others. MMS has also showed us an entirely new process of a reconnection within the shock front. So here we are now really zooming in into the so-called transition region between the upstream and downstream of the shock front. And there it's possible to see very thin current sheets that reconnect. They was first observed at oblique and quasi parallel geometries. However, the statistical observations from last year show that the reconnection or reconnecting current sheets are present for all shock obliquities. The current sheet widths that we are discussing here are about eight kilometers. So here, on the uh, space travel observations, this is about one minute interval in the shock transition from down. This is downstream, upstream, and within there, there is this very fine sub-second scale current sheet. The current sheets typically feature electron-only reconnection. And its primary consequence is a relaxing thematic topology, so not very heating. So now we have gone smaller and smaller. So where else can we go? So I would like to highlight comparative planetary foreshock studies because our Earth is on, on one size and at one spot in a specific location in the solar, solar system. And of course, we can have very detailed observations from here, but to understand how the processes depend on various upstream conditions and system parameters, we need to go to other planetary environments. So already very early on with Voyager and uh, Pioneer observations, the 30-second ULF wave scaling was shown as a evidence of particles being reflected at all planetary foreshocks, so all planetary shocks. Similar type of scalings have been shown for the hot flow anomaly size. So there is now evidence uh, of hot flow anomalies being bigger, the larger the system size is. So the bigger the distance, the hot flow, uh, discontinuity can sweep across the uh, bow shock, the larger the hot flow anomaly will develop. However, uh, however, there's also an increase in the solar wind Mach number as you go to the bigger system sizes of the gas giants. So there, um, these interconnected dependencies need to be considered. And we are also really waiting for the big Columb observations from Mercury to re really consider the smallest uh, system that we can and its dynamics. And while we can build these uh, maps, there also uh, are system-specific dependencies and interesting phenomena going on at the other locations. For instance, uh, Venus, a hot flow anomaly, does not uh, cause a bulge similar to Earth. However, there, because there is no mantosphere, the 
uh, bulge will be on the ionophores of Venus, directly affecting the atmosphere in a very much smaller system. Also, there are different processes entirely that we can study at other, other planetary environments. For example, at Mars, it has been shown that there are four shock exosphere interactions creating different types of waves. So part of this uh, effort is the um, ECT um, uh, um, four shocks across the heliosphere, where we are trying to study which of the processes are system specific and which are universal. And we were the last EC team to meet together at the EC facilities in Bern. And I, uh, these face-to-face uh, -face interactions are really valuable for discussing uh, uh, complicated processes and also very different views. And in case of planetary studies, all the systems are different and the, also the measurements you can do at different places are, are different. So actually ha sitting down together uh, and discussing them is highly valuable. While we were at uh, EC, we also chose our team mascot as Triceratops, drawn here on the right. And we chose those uh, triceratops because, as we understand it, the study of triceratops at the moment focuses on studying their skulls and trying to understand which triceratops skulls are young individuals and mature individuals of the same species based on changes in their uh, face cell structure and which of them are too different to be within this evolutionary uh, age evolution of the same species and which are and are different species entirely. And there are big debates about what can the metaplastic bones of triceratops uh, skull actually do as an uh, individual ages, which changes are possible uh, and which are not. So this is very similar to the debates that we are having in the foreshock at the moment about which phenomena evolve from or simply an evolution of one structure to another and which are actually do different uh, species in a way. And why do we have these uh, debates? That's because we don't have yet the sufficient uh, observations to make these distinctions. So to illustrate the fact, well, with two spacecraft, like IC1 and 2, you can understand the one-dimensional motion of the structure. And this was highly valuable for actually convect with the solar wind towards the Bauschuk. 2D motion can be resolved with three spacecraft. And 3D motion, that is a planar structure, its orientation and speed, can be resolved with four spacecraft. So this is our state-of-the-art cluster and MMS. However, with this present four spacecraft measurements, we, we have been clearly been able to demonstrate that four structures are not planar, and they don't move at constant speed, and they don't stay the same as they move across the space, uh, spacecraft. For example, here, this cluster observations, as the slams, across the four spacecraft. At the same time, it was also growing. So if we want to distinguish growth versus motion of uh, structures in the Bauschock and Porschock, or quantify non-planarity, or measure nonlinear gradients, we need at least seven spacecraft. So therefore, the next stage for Earth should, in my opinion, really be a constellation mission. Thank you. Thank you, Hallie. Oh, this is Marcos. This, first of all, Hallie, this is a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. We have uh, many questions. I'm not going to read all of them. So if I'm not clear enough, please, the person who asked it, just mute and clarify for us.
Uh, the first one is on the slide six. It's from Bishodit Oja. And he is uh, asking, what is, the, what is the time scale difference between the, the drift shock and the fusion shock acceleration? And how to distinguish these accelerations by looking at the in situ observation data? Uh, the diffusive shock acceleration uh, should result in a distinct uh, uh, exponential decay of the particles the further you are from the shock. So this has been measured at the Kosipal shock, for example, by Kisedo. But for uh, the drip, uh, shock trip acceleration, we can see signatures of that at the quasi perpendicular shock of Earth. And, yeah, Okay. Yes. It's better if you show your slide and for us because we are seeing in your video. Okay. Um, Thank you. So, and on the slide nine from Dolores, is there any? any ionospheric signature of the different first shock particle population, especially in the ions on the, down, the downside? Well, the main signature in the ionosphere of the first shock dynamics comes from, it's mediated by the transmission through the magnetosheath and then the, any effect, the effects on the magnetopause, for example, compressions, expansions, and therefore which then lead to waves in the magnetosphere and then these waves then lead to the precipitation of uh, ionospheric particles. There's some particles of course get in from the cusp but the main effect on the ionosphere uh, comes from this chain of uh, events that goes on from the four shock, bow shock, magnetosheath, magnetopause, magnetosphere. And I, get, I think we will hear more about that next week with um, Okay, and also in the slide nine, so do these asymmetric particle distributions relax and generate the plasma turbulence? Uh, yes, so the, the field line beam distribution seen at the edge generates then the uh, waves, the 30 second waves, and then as the more these waves interact with the distribution functions, they turn into more intermediate and diffuse. But there's also the local generation of waves from those distributions themselves. So in the end, yes, the, there's the enhancement. If you look at the turbulent spectra, turbulent spectra in the force you can see the peak at the around the 30 second waves, the enhanced power, but there's also enhanced power at other frequencies in turbulence. And in the slide 11, has, there is a comment from Lynn Wilson. And he, say, he says that the Blasiator example of a B-field aligned beams looks like a gyrophase bunch of ion velocity distribution functions, not a field aligned beam. That is, the field aligned beams are not gyrating rings or gyrophase bunch of partial rings about B0. So far, he is recalled. So he's not sure this is a bad thing given that gyrophase bunched ions tend to be seen with ULF waves as an evidence of wave particle interactions. I don't know if Lin has something to comment on that. Yeah. Or I was just pointing out that the, the, the shape, I would call it more like a gyro, gyrophase bunched ion beam, which is, starts as a field line beam, but then from wave particle interactions becomes gyro phase bunch. So the so I, it's interesting and cool either way. It was just a clarification. Uh, I see one person from the Vasiator team raised his hand. Yeah, hi everyone, Marcus Batsabe here. Um, so if you look at the image that then you can see that uh, that is actually right from the edge of where we detect any kind of backstreaming ions. So 
that's not actually a gyrophase bunch distribution. It is spatial sampling from a gyrating population. And you'd start to see a, a more regular uh, field line beam type population if you go to the more orange yellowish part of the foreshock. And something to note also is that um, in Vlasieta, we don't yet get the, the super high energy field aligned beams that are seen in spacecraft observations um, because, because we're not actually looking at that low phase space densities necessarily. But yeah, there's a lot of open questions with these still. Okay, good. And general question from General slides from Sergio Dasso. The structure is created by the first shock. For example, the bubbles or hot flows are more or less stationary during certain time in the solar wind near Earth. Why they are not advected? Uh, um, they are advected uh, all the time. So they are like, at no time they are uh, stationary. So as the rotational discontinuity, for example, here on the slide. Uh, 14 is advected by the solar wind, so the force bubble moves, it forms and moves at the same time closer and closer to Earth. Similarly, the tension, uh, when you have a hot flow anomaly, it starts forming at one side of the power shock as the tension so discontinuity intersects that side of the power shock, but then as it develops and matures, it's um, being moving across the power shock as the tangential discontinuity is advected by the solar wind. So they are not really, at any given time, they are not just hanging there. They are all the time moving with the solar wind. Okay, thank you. And from Cheyenne Adkari, is there any significant work available on first shock using the hybrid particle in cell simulation? So there's a number, a very long, number of uh, studies done by Nick Omidi starting from 2005 with the hybrid particle and cell code. For example, the picture here on this, of this force of bubble is from Nick Omidi simulations. And mm, there's also now work done into in, with other models and also uh, Homa Karima body has a number of papers on force of uh, studies with uh, hybrid particle in cell. Okay, and then you, you can provide us the, the reference and we can put in, the web, in our web later. Thank you. So, and the slide 14 from, if electrons are mostly energized, then how they have isotopic temperatures downstream to the bow shock? Where, where, in, con where in contrast, contrast ions are more, uh, Anisotropic? Is there a wave electron interaction dominating? How? All questions from Bish. Bish from Bish. Did. So, this, uh, um, uh, uh, the bow shock itself accelerates both electrons and ions. And then you can see about the ions downstream. Um, uh, Upstream, we see these very distinct different sort of ion populations, and then you can see a little bit of that patchwork also downstream for ions, and then electrons on the downstream of the perpendicular shock have usually flat top type of distributions, while they are more isotropic on the quasi parallel side. On this slide, on slide 14, when I refer to the electrons and ion acceleration, this this is simply, uh, this is, refers to the core region, hot core region of these transients. So in addition to all the acceleration done by the four shock, sorry, the bow shock itself, there are these localized sites of about three RE or more where uh, enhanced electron acceleration happens compared to the surrounding four shock. I think there are further questions in that no. list. <laughs> Thank you. And from Natalia Buzulokova, what is the role 
of foreshock kinetic structures in the overall energy transfer from the, subsolar, from the solar wind to the magnetosphere. Are there any publications or review on this topic? Mm. Oh, well, that, that, that's a hard, hard question because I'm thinking of giving you a number, but there's the, I don't think there is a distinct number to, that I can give, but there's a wide range of studies looking at the different uh, energization processes, but this is um, the, on the overall uh, slowing down of the uh, solar wind and thermalization and then the um, what is for example the temperature of the magneto sheath and when you talk about this transfer then it's more the realization over the last decade or so that the there are the sort of average properties but then you have these localized transients like the Porsche bubbles uh, the hot flow anomalies the uh, various uh, jets created by the slams that then add on to this transport. And we are now really all getting into the deep um, quantifying this added transport in form of these structures. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot give you a number at this moment. Okay. Thank you. And also Lynn wants to know in your slide 23, who drew the Lego Topsian, the big of dinosaur. <laughs> Elaine wanted to know what about the um, dinosaur? Who drew that? Uh, I drew that. And from Christine, uh, are the MMS separated enough to determine the planar motion? Uh, the for. Ion force structures, the MMS are too close together to this um, to really see the planarity. So they are, if we the let's fault. look at this slide, then the MMS is a, would be a dot inside this tetrahedron. So the it can look at very local uh, from their point of view. It, things in the ion force probably are more pretty much planar. However, in the Quasi perpendicular side where the scales are smaller, then uh, MMS scales are good for the quasi perpendicular shock structures. And how far uh, between the spacecraft would you recommend? So, for the iron core shock, we would need uh, say 200 to 300 kilometers, and then for the let's say inner part of the constellation. And then the bigger part should be at least one RE in scale. Uh, ideally, I would like an MMS type of electron uh, um, tetrahedron at the middle of it, but the, to, so that we could have the full cross scale analysis from uh, MHD ion kinetic electron kinetic scales at the same time. Okay, thank you. And from Ankush, how far shot bubbles decay and what is the time scale for that? So the four shot bubble is uh, formed. Uh, going to the right slide. Mm, upstream of the uh, bow shock and then as it gets closer and closer to the uh, bow shock then it uh, the the it merges with the uh, old bow shock while at first the magnetospheric system moves a little bit outward because of the uh, low density core region uh, reducing the dynamic pressure and then it moves back in so the force bubble shock you know uh, leading edge shock then becomes the new bow shock at least based on simulations so this uh, time scale for this depends on the orientation and motion uh, of the discontinuity and its speed of the solar wind. So we are talking about some minutes or on time, minutes time scales. Thank you. And from Louise, uh, what is the expected behavior of the VDFs 
uh, temperature anisotropy inside and outside the localized structures in the first shock, for example, the cavitons or HFA, there could be some relation between this behavior with the generation mechanism of these structures and their evolution? So usually the uh, cavitons and uh, uh, on the, the hot, hot, uh, hot, uh, um, hot power anomalies of different kinds are associated, associated with diffuse ions, uh, the, both inside and outside of them. But there's uh, only a couple of papers so far from MMS really looking at the fine internal differences in the ion uh, VDFs in the force of uh, transients and, and mainly used so far to uh, re really verify that the, it is the reflective particles that get uh, focused and channeled into the discontinuity. So there's, um, I would point you to the paper by Schwarz et al. from 2018 that looked at the ion distributions inside the hot flow anomaly, but this has not been systematically done with MMS to all transients yet. Okay, thank you. And from Zubar, how upstream magnetic field of the bow shock controls jets formation? Uh, uh, does this refer to the downstream jets? Or uh, uh, that, that I'm also studying? or? I think, yes, I think you should answer the question, what, how, how does the IMF control jet formation or what causes jets? So the, um, so if we look at this picture here, you can see that the classic parallel shock is a patchwork of slams. So it's very uneven. So there's two positive, uh, like two main, uh, mechanisms that are currently discussed. So the, the fact that the quasi parallel shock is uneven, so you can call it also rippled, although rippled at a larger scale than the quasi perpendicular shock. And then because it's uneven, then the more inclined locations then lead to less deceleration of the incoming solar wind. And then that would lead to be the jet, the sort of enhanced ripple scenario as it's called is that this uh, rippling and the interaction with the slams with the uh, ripple, ripples created by previous slams would then also affect the jet generation on um, this or the jets being the fast uh, localized pulses downstream of the power shock. There are also some of the jets are generated by the uh, Interponte discontinuities interacting with the uh, power shock. So, for instance, let me give you a picture of the uh, hot, flow, hot flow anomaly. So, here at the uh, edges, uh, you can sometimes at the edge of a hot flow anomaly or force bubble, you can also see an enhanced flow. So, there if you have uh, upstream drivers, then those cause a minority of jets. But the majority, the, ma majority is controlled by the IMF orientation being downstream of the quasi-parallel region. That is the short answer. I believe you can provide a reference for that, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. And from Joanne, given the fact that the Earth's bow shock alters by all sorts of instability and is highly dynamic, what is the best way to estimate the propagation time of the solar wind from bow shock to the magnetopause, in your opinion? Um, well, it, I think that depends uh, quite a bit on the application. So whether you're, what sort of spatial and temporal scales one is interested in. So that the, um, whether you are interested in say your intrapronte shock effect on the uh, magnetosphere, or are you interested in a particular solar wind structure, interact, a smaller solar wind structure interacting with the 
um, among the sphere because then usually it comes down to estimating the uh, geometry of that structure and then how that it actually affects the magnetosphere because usually that sort of uncertainty is then bigger than, than any local dynamics of the shock. Um, I'm, I really think it uh, depends on your application and the time scales and spatial scales you are interested in. There usually is no one uh, easy way of doing it. Okay, thank you. And then in the slide 16, the K deflected from B approximately 20 degrees by super thermal ions. And why not by the other angles? From Ashutoshi. Uh, so the, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but the, so, the, uh, the per from theory, you would get that the maximum growth rate of the instability is along the magnetic field. But then, uh, um, as the waves are formed, the, the spatial variations in the four shock uh, uh, suprathermal particle populations cause then the propagation of the waves vary at different places. So then you end up with deflections and refraction in spatial sense uh, from this uh, the, uh, from this exactly along B to about 20 degrees from the B. And the Ling ha had like a comment on this, the same topic, right, Ling? If I understand. The electron one? Yeah, about the lactone and isotropy is smaller than the ions, but they are not yeah. I was just clarifying for uh, this wall uh, uh, that the um, they're not isotropic in the downstream. It's the if you look at the entire distribution and compute the temperature anisotropy for the entire VDF, you'll get something much closer to isotropy than if you actually separate out the different populations and look at them because they each of them behave differently across the shock and they're individually anisotropic in different directions. So the core is often more oblate parallel to the field, while the halo and straw or the super thermal electrons are more oblate perpendicular to the field in the downstream. So the, the total anisotropy of the entire distribution looks like it's uh, close to isotropy, but each of the populations can be very anisotropic. Okay, thank you. So that's all the questions that we had. That was very interesting talk. Thank you very much, Hallie. Thank you all for all the questions. And thank you for all your questions and attention.